Can I move this bar? Oh, there we go. Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time again to uh, attend one of my lectures. Um, we're gonna treat this like a regular lecture. Uh, so if you have any questions about anything that I'm talking about, uh, any confusion, or you'd like me to clarify a little bit more, just use the raise hand feature and I will stop periodically to answer your questions. Uh, we will be using CodePen for this lecture, just like we did last time. Uh, I'll try to be a little bit more aware this time and I'll send out the links so that you guys could follow along with the code if you'd like. Uh, but I would still recommend to maybe watch the video and not follow the code. But if you have two monitors or something, throw the code on one, throw the video on the other, and you can follow along. Uh, the materials that we're going to cover today, we're going to cover um, a library called React Transition Group. Uh, and we'll get into why we're covering that specific library. But we're going to get uh, in depth with that library. And we're going to learn basically 90% of everything you can do with that library. Um, so that you, you, by the end of this talk, you should be an expert and you should be able to do some really cool animations. Uh, we're gonna have three live coding examples. I know I said four yesterday, but the extra one will be an extension uh, talk that I will do tomorrow. So we'll have just three today. So first, React Transition Group. Um, why, uh, why are we gonna learn React Transition Group and what is it? So when it comes to, um, so okay, so I'll pull up the page here, but when it comes to React animation, there's tons of libraries out there. Uh, the three main ones right now are React Spring, React Motion, and Framer Motion. And these libraries deal with animating your components through an API that they provide. So if you want to say rotate an element, um, one library might uh, have an API where you rotate the element using their syntax. And another library might have an API where you rotate the element using that syntax. So it's like they, they all follow their own APIs. I mean, they're similar in a way, but they still have their own APIs. What I was hoping to do was, since uh, the last lecture was on CSS transitions, I was thinking of how could we go about um, reinforcing some of that learning that we did from the last session and continuing our journey in learning CSS animations, uh, but this time incorporating them into React. So what React Transition Group does, rather than being an animation library, it's just a library that exposes transition stages. Um, if that sounds confusing, uh, essentially what it does is, um, I guess in like a, a, a broad example, if you have a component on a page and that component, uh, let's say something changes in the UI and that component is meant to unmount from the page. Um, in vanilla React, what would happen is the component would be visible one second, and then when it unmounts, it would just disappear. Uh, what transition group, uh, React Transition Group allows you to do is say, hey, before we remove that element from the page, let's wait uh, a, a specified amount of time, and let's give um, the developers some classes so that they're able to animate this element before we remove it from the page. So it allows you to, so it exposes um, transition stages in three places on your components. When a component is being mounted into, uh, into the view, when it's being unmounted, and when it appears when the, when the app is initially loaded. So it'll give you three places where you could add animations to your, your component. And we'll look more into detail on exactly how to add those, um, those classes and apply those animations uh, at those three um, separate stages. So, uh, so React Transition Group uh, consists of four main components. Um, so you can see them up here, Transition, CSS Transition, Switch Transition, and Transition Group. Now, we're only going to cover three of them. We're going to cover CSS Transition, Switch Transition, and Transition Group. The reason why we're going to skip Transition is because Transition and CSS Transition are very similar. The only difference is where the animation takes place. So inside of transition, don't worry about looking at this code, it's just a, a very quick example. Uh, inside of transition, the, um, the code for the transition is actually specified inside of your component, where in CSS transition, the code for your animation is actually specified inside of your style sheet. Uh, that leaves your component to be a little bit cleaner and it separates your animation from your component. That way, once your animations are complete, 
Um, you don't have to keep looking at, you know, these 20 lines of animation code every time you want to go and edit your component or add something to your component. So I sort of like the, the separation of the animation from our component. Um, okay. So because we're going to be working in CodePen with these examples, uh, there's a couple things that we need to know about uh, CodePen when it comes to using React. The first one is um, how do you add libraries to uh, a CodePen example? Well, there's this little gear icon beside HTML, CSS, and JS. If we click on the JS one, you'll see that there's some CDN links here. Uh, the first one is for the React library. Then the second one is the React DOM library. And the third one is for React transition group library. Now, this doesn't work the same way as if you were installing a package uh, on your local machine. Like, um, you know, you install React and then you could import React from React. Instead, what it does is it takes these CDN links and it creates script tags in your files and it loads those CDN files into your browser. So it's as if you just put a script tag inside of your index.html and linked to one of the CDNs. So how does that make things different? Well, we can't import specific uh, methods out of those libraries. What we get is a global that is created when that script is loaded um, that gives us access to all of the uh, methods and components that are available on that library. So uh, when we um, add the React transition group library, what it does is it creates a global object called React transition group and all of the methods and components are available to us uh, by accessing them through this React transition group global object. Now, every time we want to use a CSS transition, we don't want to have to type out this long name. So instead, we could just uh, create a CSS transition label and point it to that CSS transition component. And again, this is only if you were to uh, create, li not create libraries, link to libraries inside of a static file or on CodePen. Don't worry about the syntax for when you're going to be using a package manager like NPM. The second thing to keep in mind about CodePen when dealing with React animations is um, there's something under this, sorry, not something, there's a label called behavior under the settings uh, that allows you to turn off auto updating preview. And what auto updating preview does is as you're typing your code, it will periodically update your preview to, um, to reference what you're typing, not reference, but uh, to, to show what you're typing. So let's say like every 30 seconds, it will um, take your code and render what, uh, what the current state that your code is at. Now, this is great when you're doing HTML and CSS, but when you're coding React, a lot of the time you'll be half done coding a component and it'll re-render the view and then start throwing a bunch of errors because it'll say, hey, this isn't a valid component. It's because you're not done typing and it started auto-refreshing and, and, and checking stuff. So uh, what I like to do is turn off auto-updating preview. And uh, when you do turn it off, you'll get a run button up here that you could manually click that will uh, recompile your, your code and update the preview for you. Uh, that way, if you do get an error, you know that the error is really to do with your code and not because you were typing and it decided to re-render your code midway through uh, something that you were typing. Okay, so that's React in CodePen. Now, uh, okay, we could leave that. So let's take a look at the first component. So we're gonna be looking at CSS transitions. So maybe first we'll take a look at the final result of what we're gonna be coding. And then I'll talk you through what CSS transition is. And then we'll go in depth uh, as to how to use CSS transition and compose this animation. So if you might have noticed, when you refresh this page, this component builds in, or it um, scales from 10% to uh, its original size, or from 10% to 100% of its original size. So that's the appear. So when the app loaded on appear, it allowed us to trigger a animation. When we choose whether we want to be X or O, you'll notice that uh, now the title screen flips over and the game board continues slipping and it reveals the game board underneath. So I'll just show that one more time in case somebody missed it. It grows in, you select a cursor, flips over to reveal the game board. So what is CSS transition? Uh, which is this, this component right here that we're going to start using. What is it and how do we use it? So a brief 
overview of how it works is sort of what I mentioned before, that it gives you access to three, um, what are they called, transition stages. So three transition stages, the appear stage, the enter stage, and the leave stage. And when those stages fire, so let's say for instance, when we refresh, you notice that this is the appear stage. When the app loaded, our component appeared. Um, what this uh, component is gonna do is it's gonna give us three classes um, that will give us the ability to add an animation to this component. And after a specified period of time, it's gonna remove those classes and uh, leave the component be. So when we click on one of these items, it's gonna add some classes to allow us to animate the transition from this component to this component. And once it's done, it'll remove those classes. Don't worry if it doesn't make too much sense. Um, we'll go over these things in detail. I just don't wanna to confuse too many people. Um, okay, so let's take a look at our, our start animation. So here we have a React project where we're not using any animation. So this is sort of like what that final product would look like if somebody didn't incorporate any animation into, um, into the project yet. So we have this title screen and we notice that on load, it's just, it just appears, it doesn't grow in. And on click of these elements, you'll notice that it just transitions from one state to another. So it hides the title screen and it shows the game board. So we run that one more time. Uh, so title screen, you click and it just shows the game board. So let's quickly just go over the code um, to show you how this React uh, application is working and then we'll work on actually animating it. Um, so we have a global component named app and inside of that app, we have a state and that state keeps track of uh, a the title screen and the game board. Um, the values inside of title screen and game board are just Booleans and the Boolean is keeping track of, hey, do we want that component to be visible or not? So when the app initially loads, the title screen is set to true, meaning, hey, we want the title screen to be visible. And the game board component is set to false, meaning, hey, we don't want the game board to be visible. Then we have a method uh, named start game. And all start game does is it fires when you click on one of these icons and it sets title screen to false and game board to true. So essentially all it's doing is it's hiding that title screen and showing the game board. So we click on them, you see it hides the title screen and shows the game board. Then inside of our render method, you'll see we have a wrapper named game and a inline conditional, uh, inline conditional rendering syntax. I guess that's the proper term for it. Um, where we're checking, hey, does this dot state dot title screen, does that evaluate to true? If it does, let's go ahead and show this title screen component. Uh, then we have another inline conditional rendering syntax below here where we check, hey, is game board true? If it is, let's render the game board component. So if this is true, it'll render this. If this is true, it'll render this. Otherwise, it's not gonna render these components. Um, we don't really need to look at title screen and game board just yet because the animations are not gonna happen in there. All we really care about is, hey, um, we have a title screen, we have a game board, we want to animate these elements in some way. Um, okay, so let's see, CSS transition. Um, CSS transition, along with all of the other um, components here are actual React components. Um, if you want to use them on an element, so if you want the React transition group library to help you animate something or give you cues to be able to animate something, uh, we start by uh, wrapping what we want to animate inside of our CSS transition group. So let's say in this instance, we want to animate this title screen. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap title screen inside of our CSS transition and our CSS transition is uh, it has three required props. So three props that you always have to set. Uh, the first one being the in prop. And what this does is it's, it, it tells the library, hey, how do I know when we should give you these helper classes? Um, sorry, how do we know whether we're showing this component or we're hiding this component? When should I add these classes to your component? So in this case, uh, we actually have something in state called uh, title screen that will tell uh, the, the CSS transition 
Uh, if it's false, we're essentially hiding it if it was visible. And if it's true, we're showing it, um, we're showing it if it was hidden. And in takes a, uh, a Boolean and, and all it does is it says, hey, if it's true, I know that we're trying to show this component. And if it's false, I know we're trying to hide this component. Again, if it's still a little bit confusing, give it 15 minutes and I feel like it'll, it'll eventually click because we're gonna explain the same thing like 43 times. Um, the second required prop on the CSS transition component is the timeout uh, prop. And what that does is it tells you, uh, sorry, it tells the library, hey, how long do we expect this animation to take place? So if our component in vanilla Re React would go from a state of not being visible to being visible, and instead we want to trigger some sort of animation in between those two states, we have to tell the library, well, how long is that animation going to last so that it knows um, how long to hold out before actually making the component fully visible. So let's say in this instance, we'll just say, hey, it, our animation is going to take a thousand milliseconds or one second. And the third prop that's required on CSS transition is the class names prop. And notice that it's plural, it's class names, not class name. And what this is, is the prefix that you want to use on those classes that are gonna be added to your component um, to help you target them uh, in your CSS when we are actually coding out this animation. And what I usually like to do is say, hey, okay, we're wrapping this component inside of a CSS transition. Let's go into that component and see what class we're wrapping. So we see that there's a parent in here called title screen. So I'll take that title screen class and I'll say, okay, let's prefix everything with title screen dash. And again, you'll see what this does in a second, but this is what those classes are gonna be prefixed with, giving us the ability to target those classes in our CSS and apply animations uh, to our element. So now let me launch QuickTime and show you on the iPad a quick uh, example of what is actually going to happen or what CSS transition is actually going to do to our component. Uh, so let's go file new screen recording. Oh, that's not it. File new movie recording. I think there it is. And I don't want my face. Let's go remote iPad. Let me know. Oh, there we go. Are you guys able to see the iPad? Okay, awesome. So let's focus on point number one up here. Okay, so point number one. When we set up our CSS transition group wrapped around our component, what that component, uh, sorry, what C CSS transition group is going to do is it's going to add three classes to our component. And those three classes are going to give us the ability to add an animation to our component. Now, depending on if your component is mounting, unmounting, or appearing when the app is loaded, uh, depends on what classes it's going to add. So there's a enter class, which will be added when your component is mounted. Uh, there's an exit class, will be, which will be added when your component is unmounted. And there is a appear class, which will be added when your component initially shows up when your app is loaded. Now, you might be wondering, why is there three classes? Uh, but maybe before that, let's explain. So these ones say name here, and these ones just say X here. What do those names and Xs mean? Those are just that prefix that we set inside of the prop. So uh, if we set the prop CSS, uh, or sorry, the um, class names prop to be test, all of these classes that you see in green here, uh, like this one, this one, this one, this one, they would all be prefixed with whatever value you supplied to that class names prop. Um, and that'll make sure that if you have many components on the page that are being animated, there's a unique identifier for each of these components. So next question. There's three classes for each state. Uh, there's three states, but there's three classes for each state. Why is there three classes? If we take a look at this little timeline down here, you'll remember that we set a value to a timeout prop. And that timeout prop, uh, we set the, uh, we, in our example right now, we set the value to be 1,000 milliseconds or 
one second. So the way it's going to work is when our component enters the screen, um, it's going to add this dash enter class or whatever your prefix was dash enter class. So it's going to add that class right away as soon as your component is entering the screen. And on that class, we could specify any CSS properties we want. We could do whatever we want to that component. Then immediately after, it's going to add a enter active class. So it added one class and immediately after, like in a millisecond, it's going to add this second class. And what the second class allows us to do is to animate styles between our first class and our second class. So let's say for instance, um, the example that we have here, our first class that came in has an opacity of zero. Then that second class that comes in, this one here, has an opacity of one. We can set a transition um, that could take place over one second. And what'll happen is, hey, we're starting at opacity one, uh, sorry, opacity zero. And then over one second, we're changing to opacity one. So over one second, our component is going to animate in. And once it reaches the end, it is going to remove these classes and add one final class, letting you know that the animation is done. So um, it adds one class, adds another class right after, allows you to animate stuff. Once it's complete, it removes those two classes and adds one final done class. Now, we can take a look at how that actually works inside of the browser. So we set up our CSS transition here and we wrapped our title screen. If we open up the inspector and actually let's set this to 10 seconds. That way the classes will persist a little bit longer and we can, uh, we can see them. So I'm going to just reload this page. And if we inspect element on this uh, title screen. Well, there's two title screens. That's because we didn't remove this guy here. So we're just going to remove this secondary title screen. We do not need it because now we're rendering the title screen using this CSS transition. So if we inspect element on this title screen, we see that there's only one class title screen. But if we click on one of these icons, what's going to happen is now, like we talked about before, it's going to add an enter class, an enter active class, and after 10 seconds, it's going to remove those two classes and add a enter done class. So if we click on one of these icons, we'll see, there it is. It added a uh, title screen ex oh, exit because we're removing it, sorry. Uh, so it added an exit class and an exit active class because we are now unmounting this title screen um, from the viewport. So after 10 seconds, you notice that uh, it removed those two classes and it added a new class called title screen exit done. So it added an exit, exit active, and then after the animation completed, it added an exit done class. Now, you might be wondering, well, we ran through the animation of unmounting this component, but it's still on the screen. So it didn't actually get rid of the component um, after the animation completed. This is because by default, it will leave your component mounted to the screen. If you want to unmount the component after the animation has completed, you have to set a uh, unmount on exit prop to true. And if we set the unmount on exit prop to true after 10 seconds, um, we'll run the code. And after 10 seconds, once it removes those two initial classes, it should unmount this component. So let's give it 10 seconds. It's a long 10 seconds. There it is. Okay. So it unmounted it after 10 seconds. Um, so by default, this unmount on exits value is set to false. So it'll keep your elements or keep your components on the page even after your transition is done. But you know, we, I feel like 90% of the time you would want your components to unmount after the animation. I couldn't think of a valid reason when you would want to keep them. But if you do want them to unmount, you have to explicitly set the unmount on exit to true. Okay, so let's actually go ahead. Now that we know our classes are there and uh, our component is unmounting, let's go ahead and add some sort of transition to our element. So. We're wrapping our component, our title screen component, and we know that we're adding some classes. Um, so if we go into our style sheet, we're gonna look for this title screen. Okay, so here's our title screen code. And 
what classes do we know it's adding? We know it's adding an exit class, which is the class that's added first. It's adding an exit active class, and it's adding an exit done class. So again, it's adding this class first, and then immediately after it's adding this class, and then once the animation is done, it's removing these two classes and adding this third class. So if we want our, here we'll save and refresh. If we want that title screen to, let's do an easy one. Let's say we want it to fade out uh, when we click on one of these items um, over one second. So the initial class, we don't have to set anything to this class because we're gonna start from the current state. Um, so we're just gonna start from uh, whatever it looks like currently. So when that first, uh, when that first class is added, we're, we don't want to affect anything. But when that second class is added, we want to change its opacity to zero. Uh, and we want to set a transi transition um, that listens to the opacity CSS property and over one second animates between it. So what this is doing is uh, this class is added first and any div or any element inside of your HTML, by default, it has its opacity set to one. Like it's not, it's not transparent at all, it's not opaque. So by default, it has its opacity one. So we don't have to explicitly set opacity to one because that's the default uh, value. But maybe for this example, I'll just leave it there so it illustrates better uh, what we're doing. So this class gets added first, it has an opacity of one. Then Im immediately after this class gets added, which now has an opacity of zero, and because we have this transition here, what happens is this transition is listening to the value of opacity to change. And if the value changes, it will animate from its current value to its updated value over a period of one second. So it starts at one and it changes to zero. So that change between these two items will take one second. So if we save this and we run our project again, and we click on one of these items, what you should see now is we should see this component is starting at an opacity of one and over one second, it will animate to an opacity of zero. So if we click, you'll see that it fades out. Um, one other thing some of you might have noticed is, hey, it actually, it's weird. Um, it looks like our component, oh wait, sorry. No, that's not weird. So what's happening here is our transition is happening over one second but inside of our JS, we still have our timeout set to 10 seconds. So our component is not unmounting for 10 seconds. So it looks like it's still in the view. So let's go ahead and update that to one second. And if we run it again, we click on an item, it fades out, and now we have access to our board underneath. So the one kind of drawback is you have to make sure that your timeout matches to your CSS. Um, otherwise, your components aren't going to be unmounting or mounting when your animations are complete. Um, okay, so maybe I'll, I'll use this as an opportunity. Does anybody have any questions thus far or uh, want me to elaborate on anything before we keep going? Yeah, I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the class names, um, attribute. Oh, yeah. Can you go back to the other one? Yep. Yeah. So the class name attributes, um, mm -hmm. so what essentially it is, is like a regular expression where it's gonna look for the uh, CSS property names. Uh, when, whatever you type in here is gonna be a regular expression, right? Uh, in a sense? Uh, I don't, so the way I understand it, maybe I'm, so okay, so the way I understand it is all this is doing is setting, hey, those classes that are gonna be added to our title screen container, Okay. This is what they're going to prefix with. So if you okay. think so about it, prefix, yeah. yeah. So if you, if you think about it, all this is doing is saying, Hey, when that component, let's say when it's exiting, it's going in here and it's adding a exit and a exit, uh, active class. So that's all it's doing It's going in there and it's adding these classes. So the value that we're setting in class names is just what we want to prefix these, uh, these, um, these classes that the library is providing uh, for us. Okay, with. so you don't have that final dash behind title screen. You you wouldn't have to uh, do a double dash in your CSS, Exa correct? Okay. Exactly, yeah. And that's just a habit of using the BEM naming syntax for CSS. If it's a okay. modifier class, you use a double dash. Uh, but okay, again, right. you could name yeah. this whatever we want. We could name this like 
title animation and that would be perfectly fine then it would just be title animation dash exit dash exit active um right. and so on and the other question is so essentially uh css transition component is just a uh wrapper around whatever children that we put in and um it will put on a ref attribute on the children in order to access the underlying dom and then change the class accordingly is that the right thinking exactly yeah so this okay. is the, exactly what you just said um i won't even try to repeat it but yes exactly what you said <laughs> it's just a wrapper that uh appends classes and prevents the item from um entering the dom or leaving the dom before uh the the timeout has completed okay any 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 other questions? No. Okay. So now that we have this fade animation, um, let's see. Let's maybe try to build out. Let's take a look at rather than when a component is unmounted or mounted. Let's take a look at how would we uh, build out that animation um, when the when the application is first loaded and that component comes into view. So maybe we want it to kind of like that final example. We want it to grow from. 10% of its size to 100% of its original size. So how would we do that? Well, uh, maybe we could start in the CSS where, so we know when the component is unmounted, it's adding these dash exit, dash exit active, and dash exit done classes. So when it appears, it's actually just gonna add a dash appear, dash appear active, and dash appear done classes. Um, so the, the exact same thing. The only difference is if you want your component to have an appear animation, by default, this library turns it off. So um, when the page loads, if you take a look at your component, you won't see those appear classes on your component. Um, if you want to add them, you'll have to add a new prop uh, that is just, a, sorry, appear, and we have to set it to true. So what this essentially tells it is, hey, we also want to add some classes and fire off an animation when this component initially appears. Um, so by default, it's false. And I, have, I sort of understand why they would do that. You don't want every single component to animate in uh, when your app loads. It would just be too busy and too crazy. So they set it, uh, if you do want to uh, create a initial load animation, you just set the flag to true yourself. So now that we set this uh, flag to true, uh, we could set this to 10 seconds again, um, just to test it. And if we run it, and once our code is done building, we could inspect element on here, and you'll see that there's a title screen appear and a title screen appear active class. So setting this flag to true, now added those classes, and after 10 seconds, it uh, adds the done class and removes those two initial classes. So I hope you guys are starting to sort of see a pattern where it's like, it's just adding three classes and removing three classes, adding three classes, removing three classes. Um, the syntax here will get more comfortable with it, but um, just know that this is, this is like 90% of this entire library. It's adding some classes, waiting a specified amount of time, and then removing those classes. So if we want to animate on a peer, we can say, okay, so this is the first class that's added. What do we want to do to this component uh, when it's first added? Well, let's say we want to scale it down to 10% of its original size. So we could use the transform CSS property and we could scale it um, to 0 0.1 or 10% of its original size. So when the component first loads, this will be the first class that's added. It will show this component at 10% of its initial size. Then immediately after, it's going to add this class where we could say, hey, now we want to scale the component back to 100% of its initial size. So it starts at 10% and goes up to 100%. But because these classes are added one after the other, all you're gonna see is uh, maybe a quick blink of 10% to 100%. So we need to add a transition, transition, um, that listens to the transform property uh, over a period of, let's say, uh, two seconds. And let's also set a timing function on this one. Um, if you guys remember, on transitions, you could set timing functions, which affect how the animation is going to run. Is it going to be just a smooth curve, meaning um, 
from the start of the animation to the end of the animation, is the value going to increment on like a linear path? Or is it going to start slow, go quickly, and then slow down? Um, so we want to set a, um, some sort of path. So we could go to easings.net. And on easings.net, we have all these different uh, timing functions that we could use. So uh, let's see. If you look at maybe this one, you see that it goes in kind of quick and goes past its point where it wants to stop and then comes back a little bit. Or this one, it's sl it starts slow and then builds up speed. And this one builds up speed a little bit slower. And this one's more, more linear. Now, I went ahead and for all these animations, figured out what the best timing functions are to get the most pleasant animation out of these experiences. Um, so I, I, it, it would be really boring to, you know, to sit here and have like, watch me try this one and be like, ah, oh, it's just a slightly too quick. Let's try this one slightly too slow. Let's try this one. Uh, it'd be super boring. So I chose all of them in advance, but know that a lot of time and effort goes into choosing the right timing function. And depending on what timing function you use will greatly affect how your animation feels in its final state. Um, Again, if it starts slow and builds in fast, like it might grab the user's attention because it kind of pops into view and it's like, oh, like what was that? Or if it builds in really slowly, it's kind of like lazy. Maybe it's, it's in the back, it doesn't draw as much attention. Um, so all of these different timing functions will cause your animations to feel a different way and emit uh, like a, a different um, feeling from, from the end user. But just know I picked them in advance, so we're not going to go over picking them. But um, for this one, uh, I chose to use Ease Out Expo. And if you haven't watched the last talk, all you have to do is copy the timing function from here, go back into our code, and just apply that timing function. So you see now we have our transition where we're listening to the transform property. So anytime the transform property changes, we will animate from its current value to its updated value over a period of two seconds. And we will use this timing function uh, for that animation. So um, if we go ahead and save this, we're not going to run it yet because you might notice a problem. On exit, our animation was one second. But on appear, our animation is two seconds. So uh, there's a discrepancy here. If we take a look at our CSS transition component, uh, we notice the timeout is set to one second or a thousand milliseconds, but one of our animations is 1000 milliseconds. The other one is 2000 milliseconds. Well, how can we say, Hey, we want a different timeout on the exit animation and a different timeout on the appear animation. Well, the other way that you could specify timeout is instead of a single value, which will be applied to all your animations, you can specify an object where you can say, Hey, on the exit animation, we want it to be a thousand milliseconds and on the appear animation we actually want it to be 2000 milliseconds so this gives you the ability to customize um, the duration of your animations so if we save and run our, our uh, app now we should see as this component loads in uh, it starts at 10 percent of its initial scale and scales up to 100% of its initial scale. So if we run that again, you'll see it starts at 10% and then grows in um, and then stops. And then again, if we click on one of these icons, it fades out to reveal the board under. So there you get to see the um, two of the transition stages. One is the exit stage and one is that appear stage, which happens on initial load. And since we didn't need this, so let's get rid of it so the code is nicer. But if you look at this, we did all of that in like three lines of CSS. I know I kind of squashed this one on one line, so I don't know, maybe like four lines of CSS. Um, and inside of our JS, it's not much code. It's, um, I mean, we could squash this on one line and pretend like it's one line of code, but this is a lot easier to read. Uh, but with not much, we brought a lot of life to our application. Now, um, let us update our animation to be a little bit more fun than just fading out and revealing the game board. Cause that's, uh, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's, it's not, not very, not very good. I don't know a nice way to put it. It's not very good, but it's just not very good. So, um, okay. So let's say instead of fading, we want our, um, what is it called? A title title screen. We want our title screen to rotate, uh, maybe a little bit on the X axis and a little bit on the Y axis. 
So if we jump over to our CSS, if we want to edit this exit animation, we could do so right in here. So we're saying, hey, we don't care about this opacity anymore. We want to have a different exit animation. So the first class that's added, we're going to say, hey, we actually want to start at the state. So we don't want to add any styles to this component uh, at this point. So we're going to leave this exit class blank, and we're just going to work on this exit active animation. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to transform uh, rotate, uh, sorry, rotate Y. And I'll tell you what rotate Y does in a second, but we're going to rotate it 90 degrees. And then we're going to rotate, rotate on the X axis 45 degrees. So if you haven't used the rotate uh, function value before, we'll just quickly pop over to Mozilla. So rotate X, what that allows you to do is rotate your elements on the X axis. So you see it's kind of spinning it on the X axis, kind of like head over heels. Is that a term? I don't know. Um, it kind of just spins it on the X axis. So it's as if the X axis is here and it's spinning uh, on that axis. Tariq, I'll, I'll get to the question one second. And then on the Y axis, it's just spinning on the y-axis. So y is uh, up and down. So you see that if there was like a pole in here, it's spinning around that y-axis pole. Uh, yes, Tariq, question. Yeah, just I wanted to see if there was something similar to the easing functions, you know, website that you had that kind of had these like pre-built sort of nice effects. Do you know about anything like that with the, you know, the transform? Uh, like 3D rotate and X and Y, or, or do you just sort of play with it and figure out what you want? Okay, yeah, so um, uh, yeah, we could totally get into that. So how did I come up with these values? Did I find them on Stack Overflow? Did I copy them from some other really smart animator guy's code? Um, no, so usually, usually what I end up doing is um, I'll inspect element on this element and I'll be like, okay, what do I sort of envision this animation to be like. And I'll start playing with things. So we'll say, hey, we want to transform this. Let's say we want to rotate Y. And we know we want to apply some sort of rotation, but we don't know what kind of rotation. So I'll apply a rotation of Y of, of uh, 90 degrees or just keep spinning through it. So you see, oh, if we just rotate it on the Y axis, it's just going to spin back and forth. But if we say rotate, I don't know, 60 degrees on the Y and rotate on the X axis, let's say 25 degrees. Now you see that even though this, cause I can't spin them both with my cursor at the same time, but you'll see that it starts giving you like an interesting effect where if you rotate them both at the same time, rather than only rotating on one axis, you're gonna start getting rotations on uh, like different angles. Um, and that just sort of comes from uh, knowing how rotate Y works and knowing how rotate X works. And if you combine them that it's going to rotate, not just along the one axis, but rotate on an edge. Um, so I just sort of play around with these values and I'll, I'll set them inside of my animation and trigger my animation. And if it doesn't look good, I'll update the values. So it's kind of a little bit of like back and forth of testing different values till you find one that you're happy with. Um, is that okay. Perfect. Um, okay, so let us just rerun this so it's not all, all twisted. But so what we're going to do is we're going to start in its initial orientation. So again, because we don't have to set styles on here because the default transform styles for like rotate Y would be zero because we're not rotating our element at all. So you can set rotate Y and rotate X to be zero here if you want it, if it makes it easier for you to see, oh, it's animating from zero to 90. But because our item's not rotated, we just sort of know, um, that's a bad thing to say, not sort of know. We, we know that the default state, we're not rotating, so it's starting from zero, zero anyways. But if you want, you can leave this in here to give you a, a better visual of saying, hey, we're starting at zero rotation and we're, we're animating to these two rotations here. Sorry, Mariusz, real quick, yep. the little typo, I believe, on, oh, well, oh, you took it away, never mind. Okay. It was a rotate typo, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, so if we want to animate from zero to, uh, let's say, 90 degrees on the rotate Y and the rotate X, what do we do? Again, this is going to be very repetitive for the next hour, but all we do is set a new transition in the CSS where we're listening to the transform value, and we want to animate, let's say, over 0 0.8 seconds, and we want to set 
um, some sort of timing function. So in this case, we will set the ease out, uh, ease, sorry, ease in quart. So we'll go in here, we'll grab this timing function and we'll go back to our code and we'll set that timing function there. So again, it's listening to the transform CSS property. It's at zero at this state and then it updates to 90 and 45 and it'll go from zero to 90 and 45 over a period of 0 0.8 seconds using this timing function. Now, this is 0 0.8 seconds on exit, but if we remember inside of our JS, our exit is set to 1000 milliseconds, so let's go ahead and update it to make sure it matches our CSS transition. Just always remember to match your timeout inside of your component to the transition duration inside of your CSS. So, if we run this code and take a look at what our animation is now, so it still scales in, but when we click on an element, you'll see that, oh, it's doing like this, this cool flippy thing. Um, so it's like the start of our flip. And once it's done going to the middle point, it just unmounts. So it flips and then it just disappears. Now, one thing some of you might have noticed is when we start this animation, so watch, when we click on one of these, you'll notice that the game board is visible right away. It's not waiting for this component to unmount before it becomes visible. So if we click on it, it's animating. The game board was already visible as soon as it started animating. Now, why is this happening? It's happening because when we click on those icons on our title screen, it triggers this start game method, which immediately changes the title screen to false and it immediately changes the game board to true. So the title screen becomes, whoops, sorry. Uh, the title screen becomes false here. Yep. Uh, it becomes false, but our CSS transition is preventing it from disappearing right away because we have a animation that we need to occur over 800 milliseconds. So it's gonna wait 800 milliseconds before it actually sets this to false. But our game board, doesn't care. It's just like, oh man, let's change our value to true. So as soon as we click on this icon, it's changing game board to true. And our code on line 36 down here is saying, hey, if the game board is true, let's just show the game board. So it's not waiting for this animation to complete. It's just showing the game board right away. Now, what if we did want this game board to only show after that animation was completed? Well, um, React Transition Group actually gives us the ability to invoke callbacks at certain states of our animation. So if we take a look at uh, here, the CSS transition component, if we look down here, we'll see, oh, there's a on enter, um, which is a prop that allows us to specify a callback that will be fired immediately after the enter or appear class is applied. So we have on enter, on entering, on entered, on exit, on exiting, and on exited. So in our case, what do we want to do? Well, we know that on click, we are exiting this component or unmounting this component. And we don't want our game board to show until this component has exited. So we could set a new on exited prop and this prop takes in a callback. So we'll provide it a anonymous function. And once this component has exited, we can say, okay, let's, um, Let's go this dot set state. So we're gonna invoke the set state method and we're gonna set the game board to true. So rather than setting the game board to true as soon as we click on one of these icons, so we'll get rid of that. We now set the game board to true after this component has exited. So if we save that now and we run this animation again, you'll see that it builds in and when we click on one of these icons, what you'll see is the game board won't be visible until this animation has exited or unmounted or completed. Uh, so we click on it, it animates, and then the game board jumps into place. So the good thing about the, the uh, React transition group is that we actually have a whole bunch of props that give us access to fire methods, um, or sorry, fire callbacks uh, at sp specific times of our animation. Okay, so um, let's now animate this game board. So it looks like our title screen is okay. It grows from 10% to 100% on click. It starts um, uh, rotating out, but our game board isn't doing anything. It's still using this old 
um, conditional rendering syntax where if it's true, it shows. If it's false, it doesn't show. So we could go ahead and actually wrap it also in a CSS transition. Um, so we'll just wrap our game board in a CSS transition. And we're going to say, uh, so we know that CSS transition takes three props or it requires three props. Um, oh, sorry, Tariq, you have a question? Oh, okay, sorry. Yep. Um, okay, so it, we know that it, it requires three props. Uh, the first one being the in prop, which tells us when should the animation um, fire. So what are we looking at for changes? So we're going to look at the, the game board state for changes. When it's true, it'll know to, to fire the enter classes. When it's false, it'll know to fire the exit classes. Second one is the timeout. And um, let's see, this one we could set to um, say one second. So, sorry, one set one, it's in milliseconds, a thousand milliseconds. And the last one is the class names. And again, this is just a prefix of what those classes are gonna be prefixed with. So what I like to do is I like to go into that component. So let's take a look at um, game board. And it looks like the outer class is game board. So we're gonna use that. So we're gonna say, hey, prefix everything with game board dash. So it's gonna create a game board dash enter dash enter active and a enter done. Okay, and because we're now uh, showing game board in this way, we don't need this inline conditional rendering syntax to show that component anymore. Um, okay, there is one issue with this that we'll see in a second, but let's run it and let's see what happens. So if we run the code, you'll see that, hey, the game board is visible as soon as the page loads. Why is that happening? Um, we saw that there was something called unmount on exit uh, where it didn't get rid of our component uh, when the animation was finished. We had to explicitly tell it, hey, when the animation was finished, get rid of this component. Now it looks like this component is rendered to the page even before any, any of these transitions have fired. And to fix that, there's another prop called mount on enter. And what that does is it says, hey, we don't want to mount this component until um, this in prop has uh, changed to true. So we don't want this component to render on the page by default. We want to wait until this animation is actually fired before we uh, mount this component. So we're going to set this value to true. By default, it's false. So if we save now and we run the animation and you look over here, you should see that the game board is no longer uh, mounted to our view by default. So if we run it as our item grows in, so you see the game board is no longer there. Okay, so when we click, we'll see that something happens. Now, because we set up the CSS transition, we know that it's adding these classes and what, uh, what, uh, what is it? What's the, the name of it? What um, transition stage do we want to target? Well, we want to target the enter transition stage because at this point, our game board is entering. So if we want to apply an animation to the enter state, just keep in mind we have a thousand milliseconds here, we'll go and find our game board. So here's our game board classes. We can say, hey, we know there's going to be a uh, game board enter class and a game board enter active class and a game board enter done class. So we know that these classes are gonna be added and we're gonna have one second to complete any sort of animations that we want uh, before these first two classes are removed. So let's play this animation one more time. What do we think we wanna do? So our title screen rotates to a certain point and then just disappears. So maybe we want our game board to pick up from that rotation point and rotate to its initial state. So the title screen rotates to a certain point and stops. Maybe we could have this game board pick up from that point where that uh, title screen stopped and rotate to its initial state. So to do this, we can say, okay, we know that this is the position where that title screen finished. It finished after it got to rotate Y90 and rotate X45. So if we want this game board to start at that position, we could say, hey, when this component is loaded into view, 
we wanted to start at the rotate Y 90 degree position and rotate X 45 degree position, which is exactly where that title screen left off. Then when, that, when the second class is added, we want to transform it back to its default states. So we want to say, hey, we want to now rotate it back to its original state, which is this, where the rotate Y was zero and the rotate X was also zero. And to animate between these two um, values, again, we're going to have to set a transition uh, that listens to the transform uh, CSS property. And we're going to do this over one second. Um, and we're going to use the ease out back timing function. So ease out back. And maybe to explain, just I'll explain one, why I chose one of these. So if you see this animation here, you'll notice that it goes to an endpoint, but it overshoots it a little bit and then comes back. So this will give our board the appearance that it's animating, uh, it's rotating, and it has so much inertia that it actually overshoots its stopping point uh, by a little bit and then pulls back a little bit. So it'll make it feel like it's, uh, it's got a little bit of life to it rather than just animating and then stopping because that just feels very artificial. So it's nice that it goes beyond and then pulls, pulls back a little bit. So this is the timing function that we're gonna use on our uh, enter active transition. So again, our transition is watching the transform property. Anytime its value changes, so it's changing from 9045 to 00, it will, over a period of one second, um, using this timing function, transition the two states. Now, uh, okay, it is one second. We're just making sure that this matches our uh, timeout in there. So if we go ahead and save this now and run our code, some of you are going to be like, how the heck is that? How, how do these two lines of code do that? But uh, so if we click on one of these icons, our title screen is going to rotate. And once it finishes rotating and unmounts, our game board is going to pick up where this uh, title screen left off and finish the rotation. So we click on one of these icons and it rotates and then our game board comes into view. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but it's got that fun little like kick back. So it'll, ro it'll rotate, the game board rotates a little bit beyond and then it has like a little bounce to, to give it some life. But if you look at this, like it's kind of crazy. This is two lines of code here and three lines of code here. I know I, I'm kind of cramming everything into to one line, but it's to, to better show you what these classes do. So it's maybe like five lines of CSS and uh, I don't know, maybe like t 10 lines at most if you separate all the props onto separate lines uh, inside of your component. And we take um, a React animation that's essentially just doing show hide, which is super boring, and, and giving it life. Like it, it grows in when it loads, and now it's got this crazy like tilt animation. Think about the amount of value that these maybe 15 lines of code added to this React application. Like anybody could do the first one. You add this little bit of like fun stuff to it and people are like, oh man, this is crazy. How did you do that? It must've been like a 45,000 lines of code, but it's like, it's like 15 lines of code max. So this is how CSS transition works and how you could use it to apply animations to your components. Um, now, as you saw, it's the same thing over and over and over again. We essentially have three classes, uh, depending on whether we're trying to animate the enter, the exit, or the appear um, of our component. And we're just saying, hey, these are our starting styles and these are our finishing styles. That is all it's doing. Uh, three classes, couple styles, and a couple props on here that you'll also see repeated over and over and over again. So that's the first animation example. Uh, we're going to do two more, and you're going to quickly start to realize that, wow, this library is literally just the same thing repeated over and over again. And um, all it takes is just modifying your CSS to change these, these animations. So any questions on the CSS transition component or any feedback, questions, any, anything, curiosities? Uh, Tariq. Yeah, well, two things. One is like, I, I just love how you style your X's and O's. I, is that like SVGs? That's one thing. And then not to be nitpicky, but I notice when the board comes in, it looks a little jagged. 
as it rotates and is there any way to like make it did you notice that like after so after you click the xo the start screen and then as the blue board rotates in i just noticed it has these little jagged edges is there anything that can be done to smooth that out or am i just being nitpicky <laughs> No. Okay. So first question. Um, yes, the X's and O's are SVGs and that is what the talk tomorrow is going to be about. Um, so I'll, I'll teach you guys what these are, how to animate them, uh, what they mean, why they're good, everything to do with, uh, with, with these icons. But yes, you are correct. They look good because they're SVGs. So it's all just math. Um, so they're, they're super crisp, no matter what your, uh, pixel density is, what size they're at. Um, but again, we'll, we'll go over that tomorrow. The second answer is I said I was going to do something and I didn't do it. Um, I said I would give you guys a link so you guys could follow along. So the reason you're seeing jagged edges is because of video artifacts. So there is no, so I sent, I sent a link in chat so that you guys could see uh, the code that I was just doing. But if you actually uh, check the animation in that code that I sent, you should see a smooth animation with no, no jagged edges. Um, my apologies. I, prefix this talk saying that I was going to do this. And then four minutes later, I didn't do what I said I was going to do. Um, but yeah, so you might see that once in a while, the animations might not look smooth. Uh, it's due to the video. Maybe there's internet lag or, or just, just artifacts, but uh, I will provide links going forward so that you guys could see these animations um, in your own browser. So you could see what they, they're actually meant to be without the artifacts and the, the, um, the lag. Okay. So let's go ahead and close those down. Uh, next, we're going to take a look, or sorry, any other questions? Matt from LA. Yeah, I'm um, still just a little bit fuzzy from an animation perspective on the difference between the appear and the enter, or like the load and the, the on mount. How, how would you, or how does that matter in animation? What would you use those, how would you use those differently? Okay, so uh, think of it this way. So we know that um, this library allows us, well, I guess it's, here. The, we know that this library allows us to um, access three states of the component. There's the appear, the enter, and the exit, right? The appear, um, what is it? What's the, the, the good term for it? Uh, the appear transition stage only, is only invoked when the component is initially loaded when the app loads. So that's the only time you will ever get these appear classes. When you first access your application and there's components on the page that are present there when your app loads. So that's the only time that the appear will fire. Think of this as kind of like an on load. So it's like when your app loaded, this is what we're going to animate. The enter, um, think of this in a way of this only fires when your component is not currently in the view and you change something that causes that component to come into view. So uh, you have a component on the page and somewhere in the UI, uh, you click on something and now this component is loaded into the page. That's the only time that this en these enter classes are going to be added to your component. Uh, the exit, same thing. This only occurs if your component was already active or mounted in your view. And when you do something to the UI where now it wants to unmount your component, it will add these exit classes. So appear only happens when the app initially loads. Enter only happens when your component wasn't uh, mounted and is mounted at a later time. Exit only happens if your component was mounted and is unmounted. Does that cl clear up a little bit or? I think so. So the enter classes will be added, could potentially be added multiple times and the appear only happens like the very first time you load your site or whatever you're working on. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you can enter and exit a component as many times as you want, and it's going to keep adding and removing these classes, but a peer will only fire on initial load. Cool. Okay. Um, any other questions on that first part? Yeah. Oh, Lanre. Yeah. So, so that, does, that, does that mean if um, a peer is when the app first loaded, if you animated like about four components on the page, Mm -hmm. That means all the four components will um, invoke the appear function? That's correct, yes. They will all get their own appear classes uh, attached to them, giving okay. you the ability to animate them. Now, maybe I, maybe I misspoke a little bit. When I say appear and I say app loaded, 
a peer might also fire if say you switched pages in your, uh, in your application and a new, a whole new page loaded. And there was some components that were active on that page without entering or exiting. Like the, uh, like we loaded a, like we loaded a whole new state in your, your application. So I, I think maybe saying only when the application first loads is maybe not correct. It's rather when you load a new section in your application where those components are present without, um, without in invoking them. But you guys could play around with the classes. Um, just maybe create a couple components and do some appear, enter, and exit classes and add them and remove them from the DOM and keep an eye to see what, uh, what is happening to your classes as you uh, go about your, your application. Um, Tariq. Yeah, just kind of a follow-up to Matt. So under the hood, is appear essentially doing React component did mount? Is that how it works or is it something completely different? Uh, I don't know what, like which method it's actually using under the hood, but yes, in, in theory, that's exactly what it's doing is when that component is first mounted. Yeah. It might, it might actually use component did mount. I don't, I don't know, but that is exactly what it's doing. When that component is first loaded, it's going to trigger the, the appear. Uh, any other questions? No. Okay. Let's close down this example and let's go ahead and take a look at the second one. And this first one was, it was like 40, 45 minutes long. You guys are going to notice that now that we went over all of the basics, like the in the timeout, the class names, it's going to be the same stuff over and, and we're just going to fly through these. So the next component that's available to us through react transition group is the switch transition component. And I will pull up the final example. So what we have here is just a label that says player and it shows a picture of a X. And we could just say, this is something maybe that's used to keep track of whose turn is it in our tic-tac-toe game. When we click on this, we see that the X changes to an O. But rather than just changing, it's animating between one state and another. So what switch transition allows us to do is um, watch a single component and any time a value inside of that component changes, uh, rather than just saying, like, let's say we have a div with a number on it and you uh, click something in your UI that's going to update that number. Rather than just having that div re-render with a new number, what it's going to do is it's going to say, hey, we noticed that the data inside of this div changed. Let's trigger a exit animation and an enter animation so that there's a smooth transition between the last value and the current value rather than just popping in, in another place. So let's have a look at the starting code. So here's our base React uh, component. And um, okay, so before we add any animations, this is how it works. If we click on player, you'll see that it's just updating this area with a, with a X or a O. And if we take a look at the code, we have a uh, app component, which has a state that keeps track of, hey, who's the active player? And a player click method that essentially just says, hey, if, if the active player is X, when we click, change it to O. If it's O, when we click, change it to X. So just swapping back and forth between X and O. Inside of our render method, we have a uh, player uh, wrapper where on click we're triggering this switching between X and O. Then we have a player label and the player label is this white area that you see here. And then we also have a player icon and the player icon is this salmon color area here. And what you notice is that player icon is a single component and the only thing that changes is this prop inside of here. So this, this salmon colored area, single component called player icon. So let's take a look inside of player icon and see what's happening. So we know that we're passing in the active player value. And inside of this player icon, we're checking to see, hey, is the active player or the icon in the, uh, the icon prop, is it X? If it's X, let's render this X SVG. And is it O? If it's O, let's render this 
OSVG. So depending on what we pass as the prop, it's going to render the XSVG or the OSVG, which we could see here when we click, it just switches between X and O. Now, what if we want to animate between the swap of this X and O? So anytime the value on the inside of player icon changes, we want to animate out the current state and animate in the new state. Well, this is where switch transition comes in. So again, switch transition is a component that's available to us through the React transition group. So we start by wrapping our component inside of this, uh, inside of uh, this switch transition component. And the switch transition component um, has, uh, okay, let's, let's do this. So the second thing that you have to wrap is switch transition is just gonna say, hey, we want to watch the component that's in, in not inside of us, that's sexual, um, that's inside of the switch transition component. Uh, we want to watch when its value changes and we want to trigger some sort of animation. So we're also going to wrap it in a CSS transition. And what the CSS transition is going to do for us is it's going to um, give us those classes that we're used to having in the last example. So again, switch transition is just going to watch to see, hey, when the value of this stuff updates, we want to do something. And CSS transition is going to be in charge of adding those classes to our component. And again, we know that CSS transition has some required um, props. And those props are the in prop, the um, time out prop, and the class names prop. Now, when you wrap CSS transition inside of a switch transition, rather than having an in prop, because this component is never really being loaded or mounted into the, I mean, it technically is, but it's never really being mounted uh, on the screen and unmounted when the value changes. I mean, I guess under, under the hood, it kind of is, but it's never leaving the state. It's just updating with a new value. So it's always there. The only thing that happens is its value changes. So we can't listen for a in to know when this component, this component is unmounted and mounted. Instead, what we do is we don't use the in, we use the key uh, prop. And what the key prop is going to listen to, or what the value of the key prop is going to be is, hey, what do we want to listen to to know that the value of this player icon component has changed? In our case, it's this, uh, this state of active player. So we can say, hey, we want this CSS transition to listen for any changes inside of active player. And anytime the active player value changes, we want to add some exit classes to animate our component out, and then add some enter classes to animate our new value in. So that's the difference. Just remember, if you're using a CSS transition inside of a switch transition, you use key instead of in. And when would you use a switch transition? When you want to animate the state of a single component that is just updating it values in, inside of it. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and set the time out to 800 milliseconds. And let's also, uh, so let's follow the tradition and let's see, what are we wrapping? We're gonna look at player icon and player icon has a class called player dunder icon, double underscore icon. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna wrap or we're gonna prefix our classes with player icon dash, okay? So now we know that when the player icon um, content updates, we're gonna exit, we're gonna fire some exit classes that will take 800 milliseconds. It's gonna update the value and then it's gonna fire some enter classes um, that will take 800 milliseconds. So inside of our CSS, we just go down to the player section and we can say, hey, we know that there's gonna be a enter class that's added, a enter active class that's added, and a enter done class that's added. So that's when our component is gonna enter in, but uh, maybe we should do exit first. No, we'll do enter first. Um, we also know that we're gonna have a exit, a exit, af exit active and exit done. So what's gonna happen with the switch transition is when the value changes, it's first going to say, okay, the value changed. We need to update 
its value in here. So what are we going to do? We're going to add some exit classes, which are going to fire over 800 milliseconds, which is going to cause this um, icon to wait for 800 milliseconds and to give us those classes to be able to animate. And then after those 800 milliseconds, it's going to update with the new value and then give us another 800 milliseconds with the enter classes. So it's always going to trigger exit and then enter. So in our CSS, we see we have enter and we have exit. So let's work on exit first. And that would be causing this item to leave uh, the viewport. Or sorry, to just disappear under this player label. Um, OK, so what do we want to do? By default, it's OK to start here. Because this is where before we start, sorry, as we start exiting, this is the state that we want to start at. Um, then where do we want to go? We want to transform, trans, translate on the x-axis minus 48 pixels. Now, what does that do? So translate X just takes our div and moves it uh, on the X axis, which is the horizontal axis. And in our case, it's going to move it minus 48 pixels. So it's going to move it from this position over to this, over this way. So over to the left, uh, 48 pixels. Now, 48 isn't really a magic number. It's uh, the way I got it was the width of our player icon. So the width of the salmon area is 40 pixels plus eight pixels of padding left. So that's 48 pixels. So we know the distance from here to here is 48 pixels. That way we know if we want to hide this entire container under this white area, we need to move it or translate it on the X axis by 48 pixels. So from our starting state, so from translate X, it's gonna go from zero to 48. Now we don't want that to happen instantly. So again, we set a transition that listens to the transform um, and we want it to happen over 0 0.8 seconds. And we're going to use the ease out expo timing function, which is right here. So we're going to grab this timing function. Whoops, that's over here. And there we go. So on exit, so if the value inside of this component updates, uh, we're going we're gonna to have those exit classes to play with. And what's going to happen is it's going to go from its initial state over to the left, 48 pixels over a period of 0 0.8 seconds. So if we save and we run uh, our app, now when we click on here, you'll see it goes and hides, and then it just pops right in. Why is it popping right in? Because we don't have an animation for uh, enter. And it's happening over 800 milliseconds because we set the timeout to be 800 milliseconds. So again, when the value changes, we add these classes, which cause it to animate underneath this white area. And then after that's done, it updates this, this O to be an X. And then it adds these upper classes to trigger our animation to enter back into view. So again, it goes out and then just pops in. And so if we don't want it to just pop in, we actually want it to animate in. Let's think about how we want our enter animation to function. So um, the first step is when we're entering, where is our salmon component going to be located? Well, we know that it's going to be located minus 48 pixels this way because that's where it finished when we exited. So we could say, hey, our initial transform, translate x. So we know that our initial position, we want it to be minus 48 pixels. So we want it to start underneath this white area as it's entering. And um, so it'll, it'll start underneath the white area. And then where do we want it to go from underneath that white area? We want it to go to translate x zero, which is its default position of here. So we're starting underneath the white area and we're animating out to its original position. And we don't want this to happen instantly. So again, we set a transition that listens to the transform over a period of 0 0.8 seconds. Oops, not 0 0.8 seconds. And this time we want to use the ease in out quint uh, timing function. Okay, so there's a timing function. Whoops, over here. There we go. So again, on enter, we're starting under the white area, transitioning back to its default area over a period of eight seconds or 800 milliseconds. So if we run this code, you will see now when we click, it exits and enters back in. 
exits and enters back in. So um, these three lines of CSS, I know this it's kind of like five lines, three lines of CSS give us the, uh, a, a nice pleasing visual um, representation of the icon hiding, updating, and then showing rather than just popping from the X state to the O state. Now it's kind of got some life and it looks cool and fun. Um, Tariq, question. Yes, um, are you using a Z index at all? How are you positioning that under that white div? Very, very good observation. Yes, I am using a Z index um, or Z, Z index. Uh, so player label, which is this white area, I have a Z index of 20 set to it. And uh, player icon doesn't have a Z index set to it. So it's just zero by default. So that's why we're able to get the salmon area underneath the white area. Very good observation. Um, any other questions on this concept? No, no, okay. Hey, Mario. Everyone, yes. Hey, was there a timing in between the two transitions that you were controlling or this happened immediately? Because it looked like there was somewhat of delay when it was closing and opening. Yeah, okay, let's take a look at that. So, um, so it closes. Yeah, it looks like it does. Okay, so let's, let's debug it. Um, let's see what happens. So it is 800 for both. So that should be okay. Um, let's make sure that our enter and exit, let's make sure that we're using, okay, so I ran into this issue before and the thing that it's, that's probably happening is the timing functions that we're using, when it exits, it starts fast and then slows down. And as it's slowing down in there, it's actually still animating as it's slowing to a crawl. So it doesn't pop out right away quickly. Um, so the problem is these timing functions. Um, I believe that maybe I just ended up using the wrong timing function. Let's make sure. So ease out expo. So this one, it looks like it pops in quick. So we want it to hide underneath our element fast. So on enter, we want it to hide underneath really quickly. Oh, there you go. So see this timing function that was here before. I actually copied the wrong timing function. And this is actually a very good kind of uh, lesson. So when we click run, and now you take a look at this animation, it's still, still pretty bad. Oh, okay, hold on. So I think what I did was I mixed up the timing functions. So this one is correct, but now they're the same. They're not supposed to be the same. On exit, when it's coming out from under the white area, we are supposed to use this timing function. And I'll explain. So it looks like we had them backwards. So when we run now and you click on it, you'll see it kind of creeps in slowly and then pops in. So this feels much better, right? This goes to show you how important it is to pick the right timing function. Because if you pick the wrong timing function, now your UI looks like it's broken or there's a lag or there's some sort of weird delay in between the way these elements are animating in. Um, and all that was is I actually have a different timing function that happens when it hides versus when it appears. It kind of starts slow and then builds up speed um, as it hides, but then it just pops out really quickly. So what was happening before is when it was coming out, it was slowly building speed. And that's why we didn't see it um, in, until it came out. So this is a very good illustration of the timing function that you use will completely change the way that your animation feels. That's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I purposely threw that in there to illustrate this point, but that was a, that was a mistake. Um, any other questions? No. Okay. Um, so we'll move on to the final example. Uh, I'll try to go quickly on this one. I know we don't have very much time, but um, so the final example will deal with the transition group component. And if we take a look at the final example, we have a list of items here. And when we click the plus, we're gonna add elements to that list of items. And when we click the minus, we're gonna remove elements from this list of items. Um, so what does, uh, let's see, what's the name of it? What does transition group do? Well, you know, sometimes inside of your components, you want to render a list of elements. So let's say you have a list of users and you want to, uh, let's say you have an array of users and you want to iterate over that array of users and um, add a user component to the DOM or to, to your app uh, for every user that's inside of that array. 
So that's considered a list of elements. What transition group does is it allows you to control animations of lists of elements. So in this case, we have a list of users and anytime a new item is added to that list, it fires this animation. And anytime an item is removed from that list, it fires that animation. So transition group is used to control groups of items or lists of data that's being rendered to the DOM. So let's go ahead and take a look at our starting code. Wow, where's, where, why is there a scroll bar? What is that? Let's refresh. I don't know where that's coming from. Okay, let's, let's, what? Let's fix, we'll just fix that. Don't, nobody ever do this. Don't overflow hidden on your body to fix some scroll bars. What, it's still there. Okay, let's just ignore it for now and then we'll, we'll figure it out after. I swear that wasn't there before. Um, uh, so hold on, Tariq asked a question in chat. It says, uh, whenever you get a chance to code, please send out the links. Oh my gosh, I forgot again. My apologies. Here we go. There it is. Sorry, I'm like in the zone and it's, um, I'm, I'm forgetting. Okay, so wait, why is there? So let's maybe figure out why this scroll bar is there. So let's debug real quick. It should take maybe one second. Um, so we see that we have our body and our body has our app and our app has a leaderboard. And there's absolutely no reason why that scroll bar should be there. Oh, no, margin height. Interesting. I wonder if it has something to do with code pen is not calculating the height correctly because of this. No, no. Okay. Okay. We'll figure that out after. Don't worry about the scroll bar, but let's take a look at our starting code. So this is our react application where we can add items and remove items. And as you can see, without the animations, it's a little bit boring. It's just literally adding items and removing items from the view. So let's take a look at the, the, the way this React app works. We have a app component that has a state where we have a list of users and a list of active users. And then we have these two methods called add user and remove user. And the only thing you need to know is that add user takes a random user from this users list and adds it to the active users list. And removing a user takes, a ran, uh, takes the last user from the active users and puts it back in the users. So we're just randomly picking a name from here, putting it into here when we're adding it. And when we're removing it, we're taking the last item and putting it back into users. So that's what's happening. We're, we're putting a random item in active users from users. And this, we're just removing the last item from active users. So let's take a look at our render method. So here we have the leaderboard controls. Again, don't worry about them. That's just these two um, buttons that allow us to add and remove items. We don't really uh, care what they do. Then we have a leaderboard list, which is a container that um, contains all of our items inside of our list. And what we're doing is we are mapping over, uh, we are mapping over our active users list, which is this array. And for each active user, we are generating a user component. Uh, and then we're just passing down a username and a index. So if this list grows, we're gonna get more user components in here. If it shrinks, we're gonna get less user components inside of here. And if you wanna take a look at the user component, all it is is a container where we are um, passing through the index, which is what you're seeing here. The one and the two is the index plus one. So it's, it's giving you the index of itself in the array and passing through the name to populate the second container. So there's the place and the name. But again, we don't really care too much about that user container. So if we have this um, map that's creating all of these user components, how can we say, hey, anytime we add a new user to active users, we wanna animate it in. And when we remove a user from active users, we wanna animate it out. So this is where we use the transition group component. And starting off, we wrap our, um, map or the thing that we're iterating over our data with inside of our transition group. And one thing to know about transition group is that it will actually cause a new div to be created that will wrap your content. So now we're going to have a div with a class name of leaderboard list and then another blank div in there. If you don't want transition group to uh, transform into a div, there is a prop that you could set on it named component component. 
and you can set its value to null. And what that'll do is it'll prevent a div from being rendered um, where transition group is present. So by default, just so you know, it's div. We could set it to null so that it doesn't render any additional HTML elements for us. So now that we know that this is our transition group, we can go ahead and grab our CSS transition. And inside of our iteration, we can um, wrap the component that we're creating for each item inside of our CSS transition um, component. And this might look familiar again. CSS transition takes a in as a required prop, takes the timeout as a required prop, and it takes the class names as a required prop. Now, if we remember inside of React transition group, switch transition didn't rely on the in property. Rather, it was keeping an eye on a different value to, um, to figure out whether it needed to add the enter or the leave animations. And uh, the transition group is the exact same way where rather than, than defining an in, um, because we don't actually have a single value inside of our state that tells us, hey, we just added a new user, uh, a, a new component with the name of Tariq in it, because it, we don't know how many items there's gonna be in here. There's no way for us to individually know when each item is gonna be added or removed from this list. So instead of in, we um, set a key, just like we did on the switch transition. And the key is gonna be exactly what you would specify as a unique key to your item. Uh, as you might know, React will always scream at you when you're iterating over items like this and creating them uh, in your component. It'll, tell, it'll scream at you and tell you, hey, you need a, a unique key so that we can tell all these elements apart. So rather than specifying your key on your component, you can just go ahead and specify your key on your CSS transition. And this will give the React transition group library the knowledge to know when a new item is added or removed from this list of items. So next, let's go ahead and add uh, some timeouts. And since we're sort of running out of time, we are going to set a different uh, value for enter. So on enter, we're gonna do 800. And on exit, we are going to do 500 milliseconds. For class names, let's follow exactly what we were doing before. We're gonna check what we're wrapping. So inside of users, we are wrapping something called leaderboard list item. So our prefix on our classes will be leaderboard list item dash. And again, it's gonna create a dash dash enter, enter active, and then the exit classes that go along with that as well. Okay, so now that we have our CSS transition set up and our transition group set up, we know that inside of our styles, we can look for the leaderboard, uh, what are we looking for? Leaderboard list item. So it's in here somewhere. So we'll just add it to the end. Um, and we know that it's gonna add a enter class and it, whoops, and it's gonna add a enter active class and a enter done class. So that's when our items are gonna enter the screen or when we add an item, that's, these are the classes that are gonna be available to us. But also when we remove an item and they're being unmounted, we're gonna have some exit classes that are also gonna be added for us. So we're going to have an exit, an exit active, and a exit done. So now that we have our classes, um, we can work on actually animating these elements. So first, let's start with the enter. So how do we want this item to appear? Well, you guys might not remember, but from the final example, uh, the idea was that it's kind of like a flap where it's rotated halfway and then it swings into place kind of like a saloon door would do when you open it except it's not visible at first and then it kind of appears in the place so it's like a like a sign that swings down to achieve that we need to say hey the initial state we want is not this but we actually want it to be tilted on the x-axis so that it's kind of flat and hidden at the top so we can say hey we want the initial state to be transform um, train, uh, sorry, rotate X. So we want to rotate on the X axis and we want to rotate it minus 90 degrees. And 
just as a quick recap, if you don't remember what rotate X does, let's go ahead and look at MDN. It rotates it like this. So we're essentially saying, hey, we want it to be 90 degrees. So kind of like right at its flat point. So you can't even see that it exists. So a little bit, little bit more than this. So we're saying, let's start at this point where it's tilted in a way where you can't see it. And when we are able to see it, so this transform, we're going to set the rotate to zero. So we're going to say, hey, we want this weird rotate to start, not weird, but rotate to start. And then we want it to transition to its initial state or its default state, which is this view right here. Um, so again, for the 178th time, we're going to set a transition that's listening to the transform over a period of, uh, oh, let, me, let me get my actual value, over a period of, so entering is 0 0.8 seconds. So over a period of 0 0.8 seconds, and we want to use the ease out back timing function. So here's our ease out back timing function. Sorry, I think so you there. have a typo. Oh, uh, where? They rotate. <laughs> Oh, rotate, rotate, uh, rotate X. Oh, here, there you go. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so again, all it is, is a tr transition listening to the value change on transform. So when it, it starts, it's minus 90, this class is added after changes to zero. So when this value changes, it is going to animate from minus 90 to zero over a period of 0 0.8 seconds using this timing function. So if we go ahead and save our code, and run our application and we add items, you'll see now they look like they swing down kind of like a door. When we remove items, you'll see that there's a weird pause of 800 milliseconds and then they disappear. That's because we haven't added any animation to that, um, to those styles yet. So it's swinging in, but it's not being removed correctly. So let's go ahead and work on our exit animation. What do we want to happen on exit? Well, we want it to start at its default state. This is fine. Um, and uh, what do we want it to animate to? We want it to animate to opacity zero, opacity zero. And we want it to transform, translate it on the Y axis by 100 pixels. So what is that gonna do? Well, it's gonna change the opacity of our items to zero over our specified period of time. And it's going to move this element on the y-axis 100 pixels. So it's going to move it down on the y-axis by 100 pixels. And if we want to animate from its default state to these states, we need to set a transition. And here, we're actually doing two things. We're, um, we're listening for the opacity, and we're listening for the transform to change and animating those values. So let's start with opacity. So we're going to listen for the value of opacity to change. And over a period of 0 0.5 seconds, we are going to uh, animate from its current value to its new value. And we're just going to let it use the default ease function. Um, with opacity, with different timing functions, you don't really notice uh, much of a difference. And the second thing that we're going to want to transition is the transform, which we're going to animate over also over 0 0.5 seconds. But this time, we're going to use the ease in circ timing function, which is right here. So if we go ahead and copy that, sorry, my fish in the background is trying to escape his fish tank. Um, so here we have, we have a transition where we're listening to the opacity. Anytime the opacity value changes, so it starts with one and it goes to zero, it'll animate from its initial state to its updated state over a period of 0.5 seconds. And we're also listening to transform. Uh, so our transform, we're not translating it in any direction. So all values are set to zero by default. And so we're going from zero to 100. And so anytime a transform changes, uh, it will animate from its initial state to its updated state over a period of 0 0.5, 0 0.5 seconds uh, using this timing function. So if we save this code and we run our code, you will see that when we add an item, it swings in. And when we remove an item, it kind of floats out add an item, swings in, remove an item, it floats out. And that completes that animation. And that just made me think of why this scroll bar might be here. I'm wondering, no, okay. Uh, mm, 
Remember that problem that we had where items were no, no, that's not okay. I won't, I won't get into that. Um, okay, I'll figure that out and I could let you guys know later why this mystical scroll bar is here. Um, but so that covers the final component of the React transition group. And what again, to recap, what it allows you to do is it allows you to animate a group of items. So if you're trying to render an array of items that renders something specific, when you add items, remove items, you could trigger animations in and out. Um, Lonnery, question. Mm -hmm. So on the CSS transition component, you have timeout for exit at five hundred five seconds, right? Five then, 500 milliseconds. Yeah, so and, and then on the um, CSS styles where you have two types of um, animations yep. for exit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so is, is, does that, okay, so does that mean that it's going to take 0 0.5 seconds for both of, for both of them or okay, for each of them? That's correct. It, yeah, so these don't stack. They don't say like opacity will take 0.5 seconds and then oh. uh, transform will take 0.5 seconds. They happen oh. if the value of opacity changes, it doesn't care about any other property. It will animate itself over 0.5 seconds. When transform changes, it'll animate itself over 0.5 seconds. So oh. they're independent. Oh. They don't stack. Oh, okay. Uh, Ty. Uh, two questions again. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so first one, would we have a problem uh, combining this with uh, if we use CSS module uh, with like a CSS or something like that, because mm -hmm. uh, we're just checking for a prefix, right? And it shouldn't have a problem looking into our SCSS and seeing that, uh, no, not SCSS, but the resulting module, which has the random string behind it. So because mm -hmm. we're looking for prefix, the resulting uh, class name, even though it has the random, uh, postfix, it wouldn't have a problem understanding the class uh, names. So I think in that scenario, if you wanted to use styled components, this is where you could use the transition component rather than the CSS transition component, which will allow you to um, add styles directly in your component oh, rather okay, than, than uh, CSS styles. Yeah. Um, there might be another way. I haven't played around too much with, uh, with styled components and animation because to tell you the truth i'm not a huge fan of styled components but um not yet maybe i'm gonna learn to love them eventually if shane's listening but um yeah so i i haven't played around too much with it but i know that if you are using styled components yes you can you can still use these animations and there might be a way uh, this is just a guess i would say if you're using a styled component in here maybe you could actually reference that component um class in let, I don't know, let's say for instance, we had like uh, my class and this was our class inside of our, our component, inside of our styled component. Maybe we could actually say, okay, it's gonna be my class dash enter. And when we specify my class on the class names, when our project is compiled, it will replace, cause it's gonna replace this class with gibberish or like a, whatever, office, an obfuscated name. Uh, it'll probably, well, hope, I don't know. I don't know if this is true, but I would assume it would, you shouldn't assume. It'll go in here and it'll be like, oh, this is the same class as this. Let's also obfuscate these classes that were built here. I don't know if that's the way it works. I hope it does, but if not, you can use transition instead of CSS transition for your animations. I just forgot the second question, so never mind. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so just to recap quickly, CSS transition allows you to add uh, or listen to the state of your component. So when it appears by default, when it enters the view and when it leaves the view and it gives you classes to be able to add animations, switch transition allows you to listen to a single component and listen for when it's value updates and animate that value change rather than just popping in and out. And transition group is used for when you have a list of items and you want to animate new items being added to that list and new items being removed from that list. Um, yeah, any, any other questions? I remember now, what about the okay. done, <laughs> what about the, the done stage? Uh, yeah. Oh, the or done CSS. stage. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, so we've never touched this, but let's say for instance, um, on enter, uh, our, let's say, so we, when, when it enters, it swings in and, and stays in place, but let's say for instance, we wanted to, um, let's say we actually wanted it to stop at, 
25 degrees, right? So if we save this and now we play our animate, I have to rerun it. And now we play our animation. You'll see that it'll play animate to 25 degrees. But after that, after that 800 milliseconds, it's going to go back to its default state. If you wanted to maintain this unnormal, unnormal, that's not even a word, this, this additional transition, you can say, hey, when we're done, keep this style on the element. So now if we run it, um, you will see once it reloads, when we add an element, it transitions to that 25 degree rotation and stays there. So that's if you want um, some styles that are not set by default on your element to persist after your animation has completed. Does that, does that yeah. make sense? Okay, awesome. Uh, any, anybody else, any other questions? No, okay. Um, so just a, a quick reminder, I did have one more example. Maybe I'll show you guys the example and this will be for tomorrow. I will hold a quick, it'll be like 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes. So I'll hold it one hour before class tomorrow, same place. Um, and I'll go over how you do this, where these items are, or these images are SVGs and we animate them in. It just, it's like a 40 minute explanation. There's, uh, I don't know how knowledgeable you guys are about SVGs. So I, I'm going to, I, I, into my talk, I tried to cram in as much as I could without being boring. Um, so I'm going to try to explain what an SVG is, why we want to use it, how we use it and how we could combine what we learned today to create these animations here. So that'll be tomorrow, one hour before class. Um, and now you guys have nine minutes to do whatever before class or if anybody. Tomorrow is um, same time, same venue. Sa same venue, uh, one hour. So we don't need two hours before class. We could just do one hour before class. So is there um, a ticket? Is, is what, sorry? Is there a ticket for the venue? Yeah, it's nine <laughs> payments of $0. This time. <laughs> All right. Uh, you have to wear your Coatsmith hat. Oh man, oh, it looks weird on me though. It's got like this weird shape, but I'll, I'll yeah, maybe. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, uh, I don't think you posted the code example for the toggle, by the way. Just a reminder. Oh, which one? Sorry, which one was the toggle? Uh, oh, the toggle. Right, right. The Switch one. the transition. The third second. one or the, yeah, no, the second. 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 second one? Second. Okay, so here's the final code. Sorry about that, guys. I will post a all the links in inside of the, the chat and then maybe remind you guys about the, the talk tomorrow. But um, so that's the final final state of that transition. Yeah, and I'm free. Only one more talk and then no more stressing. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mariusz. You rock, buddy. You rock. Yeah, yeah. yeah Mariusz. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah go Mariusz. <laughs> I'm kidding. I can't cheer for myself. Right. No, it's nice. It's nice. I, I've to tell you guys the truth. I've actually never used react transition group until two and a half weeks ago. So this is all new to me as well. And this was sort of an excuse to, to, to be like, Hey, I gotta, I want to learn this stuff, but I'm too lazy to learn it. So how can I force myself to learn it? And the best way is to say that you're going to do a talk because then you have to teach other people something you don't know. So it was an excuse to spend the last three, four days really trying to understand how all of these components work and, and how you can animate them. So if any of you guys want to learn something, just say you're going to do a talk and then, so it forces a timeline onto <laughs> yourself and gets you to learn something. Talk driven development. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. My next, my next talk is going to be on how to be a developer so that I could learn that <laughs> in, the next, in the next week. I think you got that down, Marius. I think you got that down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming yeah. guys. And uh, I'll, I'll see you guys in class. Yeah.